The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as told according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to the twelve disciples, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are more of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a father against her mother, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In an article called White Fragility, which was later expanded into a book with the same title, Robin DeAngelo explores the dynamics of white privilege and the inherent resistance of white people to seriously engage on issues of race and inequality. Whiteness, DeAngelo suggests, is the basic assumption of, and I quote, a universal reference point. White people are just people. Within this construction, whites represent humanity. While people of color, who are never just people, but always most particularly black people, Asian people, can only, be, only represent their own racialized experience. In this article, D'Angelo goes on to argue for anti-racist education that moves white people to acknowledge their role in systemic racism with the choice or the responsibility of either perpetuating or transforming the system. Her presentation is powerful and, at least for me as a white person, revealing. I find myself described there and convicted. I've been reading another book by Ibram X. Zendi called Stamped from the Beginning, and he tells the history of history of racism or history of black people living with white people. And he quotes uh, thinkers, powerful thinkers from the 18th and the 19th century who say over and over again in different contexts that black people are inferior because you can tell just by looking at them. The article uh, that I just mentioned is only one of a lot of resources, including the book Stamped from the Beginning, that are circulating now, and especially in the week since George Floyd's death beneath the knee of a Minneapolis police officer. Protests and demonstrations are happening everywhere, even here in DeKalb, and lots of people are now motivated to learn more about matters of race and power and white privilege so that they might be better equipped to do as God asks, to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God and one another across all racial and socioeconomic lines. In discussions and study groups 
in individual hearts and minds. Truths are being revealed and sins and regrets uncovered and acknowledged and confessed. Dismantling systemic racism is a project that is going to require sustained commitment and long-term attention. And it begins by seeing things clearly and truthfully. And part of that is recognizing what all white people have, which is implicit bias and implicit bias toward our own kind. So I suggest that this uncomfortable moment in the life of our communities and our country be a time of seeing clearly, a time of acknowledgement, confession, repentance, and sustained commitment. In Jesus' words to his disciples, then and now, he tells us clearly that truth cannot, will not ultimately be hidden or silenced. Nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. This offers hope, I think, with respect to our current political situation. And more importantly, individually and as a people, we're reminded that gospel work is truth-telling, as painful and as difficult as that can be. Jesus knows that bearing witness to the truth will upset and provoke some people, and maybe even a whole lot of people. It can disrupt the most intimate of relationships. It can bring down powers and principalities. The truth is powerful, and the truth is demanding. As Jesus himself demonstrates, pursuing and living the truth can even mean crucifixion. And not all crucifixions require a cross. The story of Hagar and Ishmael in Genesis presents the most challenging truth of God's expansive, compassionate care. Isaac, the son promised by God to the bear and Sarah and Abraham, has finally been born. What had seemed impossible has actually come to pass. While Sarah delights in her son Isaac, she also has contempt for the boy Ishmael, a son Abraham conceived with Sarah's slave Hagar as a hedge against all of God's talk about bringing a, a child to Sarah's barren womb. With the birth of Isaac, Ishmael is a reminder now of Sarah's reluctance to believe God's promise, and it's a threat to the fullness of Isaac's inheritance, as Ishmael was actually the firstborn. Ishmael and Hagar are thus sent off into the desert, as Isaac is clearly the child of promise and the ongoing focus of the story Genesis tells, we might have never heard of Hagar or Ishmael again. But surprisingly, the narrative takes care to tell us what happens to the rejected child and his mother. Ishmael and Hagar are sent off into the desert. They run out of water and it doesn't look good. It appears that death must be near. But God has not abandoned these two. They may have been banished by Sarah and Abraham, but God has not abandoned them. God's wide embrace is not thwarted by Sarah and Abraham's preferences and their feelings. Ishmael and Hagar may have been excluded and cast out, but they are still precious to God. And if you recall your biblical history, you would know that Ishmael, it becomes the forefather of a great nation in his own right the Arab nation, including the Palestinians. They may be outsiders, Ishmael and Hagar, beyond the bounds of the main story, but God still cares for them, provides them water in the desert, abides with them and blesses them. And we are left to acknowledge the truth that God moves beyond whatever assumptions and barriers we might impose. A God who can hold and bless, bless both Isaac and Ishmael is not going to be limited by our categories and structures. Those outcast by us are still beloved and cared for by God. In this week's passage from Romans, Paul invites us to claim the fullness of our baptisms as we consider and embrace the truth of our profound relationship to Jesus Christ. Paul is trying to awaken us to the depths of that 
and how lightly we too often take it. Do you not know? He asks in a way that suggests that we don't. Do we not know? Do we not know or remember this essential and life-giving truth? We are joined to Christ in baptism and we are joined to one another in baptism. We have died with Christ. We are buried with Christ. We are raised with Christ, stepping away from what was into a new life that is new. Do you not know that? Our old self was crucified with Christ, destroying sin's power over us and releasing us from its death-dealing effects. That's all past. The old self is gone. The old structures of sin and the systems of oppression have been exposed. Christ is leading us away from all that was. Do you not know that truth? And if we do know that truth, how can we further it? How can we grow into it? How can we bring it to bear on the crises of these days? How can the truth of new life in Christ empower us to expose the layers of sin that ensnare us individually and confuse our common lives? How can we use the power and purpose given to us in baptism to forge communities of compassion and mutual care? How can the saving cycle of death and resurrection inspire us to confront hard realities like deeply ingrained racism while also working toward a more hopeful, a more holy future? Again and again, scripture points us to truth truth about God and truth about ourselves. May we have the courage to face the truth and to tell it and to live it in these days now, which though difficult invite living and telling such truth in ways that we may not have ever experienced before now, but make it all the more imperative. Amen. Amen.